What's going on, everybody? No Huddle Show live from at and Stadium, the site of the Eagles' latest. I mean, all they have are dominating wins at this point, but the site of their latest dominating win. God, what did they end up? 37? 37-9? 37-9. 37-9 yeah. over the Cowboys. The Eagles moved to 9-1. and one. A game that the score shows they dominated. I think they dominated the second half. First half, not as pretty. So, a lot to take away from this game. And especially, I think, there's not many times I'll say this, the locker room afterwards. Lots to take away from that. Players were very excited. I know you had a good talk with Alshon. So, 37-9 to victory over the Cowboys. Moved to 9-1. and I think we both agree the team to beat in the NFC. But let's start with the first half. Was there ever a point, and this is probably something a lot of Eagles fans are going to ask themselves, ever a point where you thought they might not win this game? No, I don't think the outcome was ever in doubt, Elliot. And this kind of has been a a trend with this team. Go back to the game against the 49ers. Go back a week before that, the game against the Redskins coming off the bye week where the first series, the Eagles offense went backwards. They had some penalties. The defense gave up a pretty lengthy drive to start that game. And I was actually in the elevator with Mike Quick coming up to the press box before the game began. And he said, I basically said to him, hey, I think this is going to be a blowout. I think this thing is going to be over early. Eagles are just too talented. The Cowboys are without too many dominant, talented players. And Mike said, you know, here's what you have to worry about. Look at what happened with teams that had buys last week. Look at what happened with uh, the Chiefs over at MetLife Stadium. Look at some other teams that had buys and came out real sluggish. And I think that's what we saw tonight, Elliot. Mm-hmm. The Eagles just came out slow out of the gate. Um, couple. The weird thing picture. is, though, they scored a touchdown on their first drive. Yep. They, looked, they looked good on the first drive. Yeah, they had, they had eight plays on the first drive and a touchdown. Six first downs out of eight plays, which is about as efficient and dominant as you're ever going to see an offense be. A couple big picks picture things, though, this is their fourth game in a row where they've scored over 30 points, fifth time all season where they've scored over uh, 30 points. And tonight, you look at what they did after the half. They outscored the Cowboys 30 to nothing after Mm -hmm. halftime. That's a testament to this coaching staff. And how much did we hear all week about, you know, avoiding the sluggish start, avoiding the rest of the bye week, how important in-game adjustments have been for this team, how important adjustments from week to week have been with this team. And I think that what we saw tonight was the culmination of this coaching staff and their ability to have teachable moments really pay off. We yeah. saw this is this could have easily slid away from their fingertips almost as if the game against the Redskins did. And instead, the way the Cowboys led it. Yeah, and instead today the Eagles just ran the Cowboys out of their own building. And with yeah. two minutes to go, Cowboys fans were streaming for the exits and Eagles fans were screaming E-A-G-S L-E-S Eagles. And I think, Elliot, the Eagles tonight cemented their place as the team to beat in the NFC. Definitely the NFC, maybe the NFL. Yep. I haven't had a chance to see the Patriots play as much, so I can't speak to that. But to me, when, when I was when we were walking over from the press box to the radio booth to record this, I was thinking, all right, well, you know what? The Cowboys aren't that good. They're, they have some talent. you know. And I, I hate all the excuses about, well, they're, they're, they're missing players. Eagles are missing players, too. It's just you don't think about it because they win by 30 every week. But as I was walking over here, I was thinking, all right, well, they beat a bad Cowboys team. But then I thought, where are the good teams in in this conference? I mean, each week we sit here, they win by 30 points. We go, okay, well, this team wasn't that good. I mean, you look around what happened today before the Eagles win. The Saints barely beat a Redskins team that the Eagles have really, not even really blow them out the first week, but they beat them twice. Um, The Rams lost in Minnesota. So maybe the Vikings at this point. But I guess guess the point I'm making is we can't just keep taking these 30-point wins. Eagles are, are... having each week for granted. I mean, they're just simply dominating the teams and it's not a matter it's not a matter of them just playing bad teams. They're just playing the teams on their schedule. And when you see these other you know, when you look around, all the games are close. It's really just the Eagles that are blowing people out week by week. And, and think about this, Elliot. You think about everything that they've had to go through tonight. The sluggish start. Um Dak had a couple of nice drives in the first quarter with the mm-hmm. Cowboys. Eagles lose Jake Elliott for three quarters. I mean that that you lose your kicker. So yeah, they you're beat not him without be, a kicker tonight. You're not gonna be kicking field goals. You're gonna be going Going for it on fourth down, which is when Carson Wentz had maybe his most impressive throw of the season on that fourth town 17-yard touchdown to Alshon Jeffrey. Um, you look at the fact that they had to overcome a slow start. They did that. They checked every box tonight, and yeah. they did it in a hostile environment on the road. And listen, I get it that this Cowboys team, and I talked about it all week. We both wrote about it. Without Tyron Smith, without Ezekiel Elliott, without Sean Lee, this is a much different Cowboys team. It's it's not a very good football team without those three guys, but it was a desperate team. And, and right. you look at what they were able to do in the first half. You know, they kept it close for the first half of the game. They were winning they actually, at halftime. Yeah, they were winning at halftime. And 
the Eagles' talent once again rose to the occasion, and that's why I don't know that there's a team outside of maybe New Orleans that can beat this team because the talent difference and the depth at every position. Mm -hmm. Eagles rushed for 215 yards tonight. They've lost Aaron Sproles way back in week three. The Eagles tonight have done a great job on defense. They lost Jordan Hicks. You wouldn't even know it. The Eagles offensive line lost Jason Peters, and you haven't really seen a drop-off with Halapilo Viti Vitae. So you just look at the depth from top to bottom, the fact that they won this game when Carson Wentz wasn't at his sharpest, and the fact that the defense scored a touchdown touchdown you let's, check yeah, all the boxes yeah, let's talk about Wentz for a second because he really started off slow I mean I'm not saying it was the worst bit of football he's played this season but it certainly was some of it I mean in the second quarter he goes two of nine for a total of nine yards besides that first drive he really was not that good in the first half and he was erratic um I don't think that's something I could say about him very often this season but he was low on some throws he, he just didn't seem as in control of the offense as he normally does I'm he not sure took some really he really did. big hits he did he did and I mean he uh, briefly went in the medical tent. Um, so, you know, maybe something was going on there, but obviously he came back and played. But to me, the thing that you saw tonight from Wentz was why he's such an elite quarterback prospect. I mean, it's not easy. Right, let's just talk about Dak, actually. You saw what happened to Dak. I mean, other quarterbacks let things snowball on them. Wentz doesn't do that. I've said it time and time again on the podcast, but th this is what you saw again. I mean, Wentz has a really bad second quarter and bad first half overall. Then he leads his team to, you know, 30 straight points or whatever, besides that Nigel Bradham touchdown in the second half and makes some amazing plays. I yep. mean, you know, it every week we talk about how good Wentz has been. And the thing I kind of want to drive home on the podcast tonight is don't take it for granted, Eagles fans. I mean, this is not like something – maybe you should get used to it with Wentz, but they've had a lot of bad quarterback play here at the Eagles over the last few years. And now Wentz is killing it every single week outside of these two quarters. And it's impressive. I mean, there's really no other way to say it. Like, he makes two or three plays a game where you're like, wow, this guy is good. And I tweeted it during the game. If he doesn't win NFL MVP this year – why even give out the award? Well, I, the, Tom Brady. I mean, you look at Brady this year, 23 touchdowns, two interceptions. He threw three touchdowns today in Mexico City. Listen, yeah, Carson Wentz yeah. has been phenomenal. I'm just saying that – Well, I think you have to take expectations. here we are right. in year two of Carson Wentz's career and Tom Brady at the age of 40. And less than 30 games into Wentz's career, we're already putting him in Tom Brady's company. Yeah. Th that, to me, is impressive enough as it is. And I think that what we're seeing out of Wentz is a testament to his work ethic, his drive, his mindset. Ronald Darby said this week that until he was – back from the uh, IR, he had no idea that Carson Wentz shows up to work at 5 a.m. every day. And he mm -hmm. tried to race him back to the building each morning, and he just couldn't beat him in to get right. there early enough. So that's the kind of dedication to his craft that Carson Wentz has. But like you said, he overcame a really shaky start to the game. And even if we just look at his final numbers, and they're not going to jump off the page tonight. 14 to 27, 168 yards, two touchdowns, and a passer rating of 95.9. Even in a mediocre, by his standards, performance this year, he still had one of the most impressive throws I've ever seen him make. To put that ball over the outstretched fingertips of Jordan Lewis on that 17-yard pass to Alshon Jeffrey we touched yeah. on earlier, even in a subpar performance by his standards, to have that kind of throw in you shows you that he already is one of the greats. Because not everybody is going to have a passer rating of 117.3 every game, but if you can have a quote-unquote down performance and still make enough big plays in your team's biggest games, that's the type of quarterback that can lead you to championships. That's the type of quarterback that we might be talking about having Hall of Fame yeah. enshrinement ceremonies for 20 years down the road. And the thing I'll say too is, and I'm sure there'll be some people listening that'll love to hear this, I thought tonight... That catch Alshon made on that touchdown was one of the first number one type receiver plays I think I've seen him make this year. I mean, that catch was incredibly impressive. I agree the throw from Wentz was good, but Alshon to you know reach out across the goal line, fully extend himself, pull yep. it in, in hold in traffic, hold on, bring it down. That's that's the type of guy. That's the type of catch you pay nine point five million dollars for. So him and Wentz are really starting to get on the same page. I think he's got what four touchdowns in the last three games now. Six his, touchdowns on the year. Yeah, his numbers are really starting to come up. Um, so that, obviously that's a good thing for the Eagles. Let's talk about the running game a little yep. bit though. Um, didn't do that good in the first half. I think they only had about thirty yards of rushing in the first in the first half. They end with what would they end with 215. here? Two fifteen. Two hundred and fifteen yards. Obviously a huge portion of those was Jay Ajayi's seventy one yarder. 
That's only why 13 I mean, yards from Carson Wentz rushing. And how many right. times, Elliot, have we talked about these big rushing performances? I go back to the Kansas City game, go back to even the Giant game, and you say, oh, well, Carson Wentz had 45 rushing yards. Carson Wentz had 50 rushing yards. You're seeing the running backs take command of this running game. And I don't mm-hmm. know that there's a stable of running backs in the NFL that's deeper or more talented than the Eagles' quadruplet of Ajaye, Blunt, Clement, and Kenyon Barner even contributing to Yeah, it. Kenyon Barner with two huge plays. I mean, yep. that catch along the sideline, that was an amazing catch. The way he kind of twisted his body in midair, got b- both feet down, and then the play for the touchdown was a good one. Made a nice cut, you know, absorbed the contact with probably – two yards to go, carried that guy into the end zone. So I thought, you know, two very impressive plays at him. The one thing, though, that I'll say in the locker room I thought was interesting. So I'm interviewing Ronald Darby, and I can see LeGarrette Blunt talking to someone in my, like, peripheral. And I'm kind of, like, snooping a little, listening on that convo. And he goes, and this is how you know, like, this is how he really feels. Cause there's no mics there. He's just talking to a teammate. And he goes, man, on this team I can get 15 carries. He can get 15 carries. This guy, and we're all good. And that is legitimately yeah. the attitude they have. And that's what you see in the running backs. I mean, what what would they have tonight? Let's see. Uh, rushing. Ajayi yeah. had seven. Blunt, 13. Uh, Kenyon Barner, one. Clement, six. I mean, they do distribute the ball around. So, And it's impressive. And I think later in the season, you're really going to see the benefits of that. The and then J- look at these yards per carry averages. I know that Ajayi had the big run, but 13 yards per carry on seven attempts. Mm-hmm. Look, Garrett Blunt, 13 rushes, 4.4 yards per carry. That That's what you brought him in to do. Right. 4. Point yards, 4.4 yards per carry. You do that three times in a series, that's a first down. You're moving the chains. Corey Clement, six carries, 8.3 yards per carry. These are big boy numbers, and I talked to Lane Johnson afterwards. I talked to Stefan Wisniewski afterwards, and Lane basically told me, you know, we ran the ball well early on that first drive. That was the big series where they had six first downs on eight plays, got away from it for the rest of the first half, and they didn't get a first down until their first possession of the second half. And he basically said, look, we got back to running the ball. The running game worked early on. We went back to it. Mm-hmm. And you saw what happened. And, you know, I was just following along on Twitter during the game. I saw a lot of people were being critical of uh, of Doug and his play calling in the first half. I didn't think it was as bad as other people did. I mean, look, the offense didn't play well, and I think execution had a lot to do with that. I'm not saying Doug was perfect in the first half, but I thought in the in the second half, Doug really put on a coaching clinic, and I thought two calls in particular were very good. The first was the third and one on the Eagles' first drive where he ran that play where Wentz rolled to his right, and uh, Selleck kind of snuck out to the left, and it looked like a broken play. And it wasn't, though, and that was the design. He throws it to Selleck the opposite side of the field. That went for 28 yards. And then the two-point conversion, obviously with no kicker, you can't you can't go for it. So I thought uh, the two-point conversion um, to Alshon was a really good call. Yep. And, you know, two-point two conversions, those are tough spots. Uh, I thought Doug really showed that he's a good play caller and a play designer in, in that area. So I thought Doug did have a good game overall. I don't see any issues with Doug, and I – Talked about this on on the video post that's going live tomorrow, and I wrote about it in the morning. Doug, when we start litigating who's the coach of the year in the NFL, Mm -hmm. pop this tape in. Look at this game and look at what the Eagles did, the difference between the first half and the second half. That's all adjustments. That's all looking at what went wrong in the first half and then correcting it going into the second half. They outscored Dallas 30 to nothing. They lose Jake Elliott in the first quarter. It doesn't matter. They go out and they blow out the Cowboys 37-9. to and, and I just think that the way that Doug has this team playing for him, the play calls that he's been a malleable play caller. I remember doing the post-game podcast with you at Arrowhead Stadium, and we're talking about, oh, well, why couldn't they run the ball? Right. Why didn't they try to run the ball? And it's been matchup dependent all year, and it's gotten to the point where, A, the execution is so good and the play calling is so balanced that we don't even talk about run-to-pass ratio. We don't even mm-hmm. – as um, beat writers who cover this team, it's hard to even take note of, okay, they ran the ball X amount of times because this is a subpar run defense. They're just taking it to teams. They're rolling into town, and they're rolling up big points, and they're rolling out with Ws. And I think a big credit to that goes to Doug. And there's an added wrinkle in this offense. We saw it in in Jay Ajayi's first game two weeks ago, that run-pass option, where Wentz put the ball in the belly of Ajayi, and then Ajayi sold the run fake. Jeffrey sold the play fake, and they hit him for a touchdown. You saw that play tonight a couple of times. And Wentz ran and rolled out on one, and he had a completion on another. And that's as we see the season roll along when you go to Seattle, you go to L.A., and I think even in the playoffs. Elliott, for as good and dominant as these running backs are, 
that's good. There are going to be a lot of defensive lines that sell out because they think that those are actual running plays. And Wentz is going to be able to do things like hit Ertz or Selleck on that busted screen. He's going to be able to hit Jeffrey deep. He's going to be able to roll out on naked boot and pick up 12 or 13 right. yards. So that's an added wrinkle that we haven't seen. And I think that's another testament to Doug and the coaching staff that they look at their personnel, they look at what's working, and instead of just going with a traditional play-action pass, they're utilizing their running backs in these run-pass options. And I think that it's just another level of brilliance as this season is unfolding. Two, two takeaways I want to get to from the defensive side of the ball. Yep. First, Ronald Darby. I said throughout the week I thought this was going to be a tough spot from just because he's coming back from 10 weeks of not playing and he had limited snaps in training camp. I was wrong. I mean, he was, he was spectacular tonight. Um, he got matched up with Des Bryant early on in the game. They tried to hit him with the fade in the corner of the end zone. Darby said after the game that he knew that they were going to come after him. He hadn't played in a long time. He knew it was coming. And he, he batted the ball away, and then he has an interception. Um, you know, I think it was in the second quarter, the first quarter. But he played very well. He was on Des throughout the game. Um, you saw what he's going to bring to this defense. Yep. Look, like, I think Jalen Mills has played very well. I think Rasul Douglas has played very well. And I think they've earned the right to continue to play. Rasul didn't play a lot today. But? But, but, Darby is very talented. He has raw talent that those two guys to some degree don't have. And that's what you saw tonight with his ability to just come in after 10 weeks and match up against Dez. He's their best cornerback. And I think that the two plays that really exemplified that was the pass from Dak Prescott in the corner of the end zone where there was a little contact on both sides, but that's Dez Bryant. And even if mm -hmm. Dez pushed a little bit Darby pushed off and broke up the pass. And, and if any other corners there, you don't know that Des doesn't go up and haul that in. Best and then receiver the other in the one, NFL, right? Well, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, probably a top 10 or 15. Yeah, no, no I'm just but, kidding. Um, yeah, yeah, that was a big play for Darby. And I think the play that um, Rodney McLeod had the interception on, where mm -hmm. it was it, the ball looked like it bounced off of, of Darby in live action, but in the replay, it bounced off of Terrence Williams. But it was Darby in tight coverage. And if Darby's not, you know, covering him as well as he was, maybe Williams makes that catch and the ball doesn't fly into the air to Rodney McLeod. So I, I just look at, at, at Ronald Darby and what he did tonight against one of the more physical receivers in the game. And you have to be encouraged. And we've talked going back to training camp about our worries about this secondary. They've exceeded every expectation. Yeah. I think they've played above their heads, particularly Jalen Mills. But you had that kind of talent in Ronald Darby into this secondary. And you still go big picture, long term, looking to Sydney next year. Sidney Jones. Sidney Jones coming in here next year. This group probably goes from being your biggest concern or weakness to arguably the strength of the team week one next year. The second takeaway from the defense tonight, I think, and you'll probably agree, Derek Barnett. He was Beast absolutely, mode. absolutely dominant yep. tonight. Uh, in a night where we expected the defensive line to dominate, and the Eagles have a ton of talent on that defensive line. Brandon Graham, Fletcher Cox, Timmy Jernigan, Chris Long. Derek Barnett was the best player on that defensive line tonight. He caused, I think, two interceptions. Well, he caused the interception uh, that Rodney McLeod got. I believe it was him. Two or seconds. no, it was the second one. Second it was Darby's. It was yep. Darby's. Yep. And then the, the – uh, Touchdown Nigel Bradham got Burnett was in on that as well. I mean, he was all over Prescott throughout the entire game. And he was just, he was dominant. And, you know, I don't want to talk big picture because tonight was a big win. But he's going to be a starting defensive end on this line next year. It's just yep. a matter of which spot and who's, whose job he takes. He's that good. I'll and, be real interested to see the snap counts when we mm -hmm. wake up in the morning because I have a feeling that he might have played starter caliber snaps tonight. Him and Chris Long were on the field a ton tonight, and it wound up being Barnett's first multi-sack game. He had two tonight. Uh, I believe he now has four and a half on the year. Yeah, I which, think he might have another multi-sack game, but I, I think it was his best performance of the season tonight. It definitely his best all-around performance, that's for sure. And I think that, as you said, he's going to be one of your starters week one next year. And you just look at how the Eagles defensive line and Jim Schwartz can rotate ends out there now with Brandon Graham, Derek Barnett, Chris Long, Vinnie Curry. We talk about the defensive tackles a lot and for good reason, because they might be the best duo in football with mm -hmm. Fletcher Cox and Tim Jernigan, and they're going to be here for the next five years. But those defensive ends are blossoming into some yeah. of the more talented in the league as well. So before we get out of here, um, the last question I want to ask you is, I think we both agree the Eagles are number one in the NFC right now. Yep. I mean, maybe the Saints, but I think the Eagles are definitely number one. Saints are probably two. Here's a question I'll pose to you. How many more games, just off the top of your head, we can get into it later in the week on the, on the reaction pod. How many games, how many more games Eagles lose this year? 
So at Chicago next week, we'll just go through them real quick. I think well, at that, Chicago that's, that's next a layup game. That's, that, a, that's win. a win. Yep. And you know the funny thing is how we have layup wins with this teams now. Right. When you consider at the beginning of the year, you know, people had like seven or eight wins. And, you know, any given Sunday, but I think that's a layup win. I mean, you look at Mitch Trubisky, who has been the definition now, they're gonna of dominate. inconsistent. Yeah, yeah they're going to dominate. The Eagles defense Bears. against a rookie quarterback. They might put up 50 again like they did yeah. against the Broncos. Yeah, it's going to be ugly. So the Eagles win that game. At Seattle. I think they win that game. I agree. But I think it's going to be close. I think it's going to be physical. All right. At L.A. I think that you're, you're, people are going to laugh. I still think even after today, that's a loss coming off of a Seattle team. Historically, teams that play Seattle the week before don't fare too well. Mm-hmm. I think the Rams, despite what happened in Minnesota, I think they're still one of the top three teams in the conference. I don't think the Eagles sweep that West Coast swing. I think they trip up and lose to the Rams. So I'm going to pick it as a win, but the one thing I will say is I think it'll be interesting to see how the Eagles handle that week out in L.A. Yep. Um, not that this is an immature team. There, I mean, I think you're not going to see anybody getting in trouble or anything like that, but it'll just be interesting to see. I mean, a week away from home, a week in a different practice facility, a week out of your comfort zone. I think the Eagles do win that game, though. Okay, all right. Um, after that, who is it? Uh, at the Giants. At Giants. That's a layup win. You think so? I do. Divisional. All right. I, I think do. they win that one too. I might have them winning out. Now I look at it. Raiders at Raiders at home. Christmas. Christmas night. I, that's going to depend. Do they have it locked up? Because if you yeah. win, if you win four, if you win the next four games, right. you're going to have it locked up because or close to it because you will have beaten the Rams. That yep. essentially takes them or, out. Yeah. Because right, the Rams will have three losses then with one two games right. to go. The question will be what the Saints do. I'll, the Saints will be interesting. That is their biggest – that's the biggest roadblock to the Super Bowl at this point, barring just the Eagles collapsing I, I, in the playoffs, I mean, barring them yeah. just choking. I All think. things being equal, and we're going to assume that the Eagles play their starters, I think they win that game. Yeah. I think the Eagles are going to – If I think the Eagles are going to lose one more game. I'm not sure which one it is, but I think you're, this team is going to finish 5-1. and one. I think you're looking at a 14-2 and two team. I, I think thirteen and three as the one seed. But the three thing is that means they go three and th- they they go four and two the rest of the way. Yeah, they they lose one of the two on the West Coast, and I okay. think that they they rest their starters because they'll have home field locked up, and it'll be a kind of a meaningless game on New Year's Eve, like it was on New Year's Day when the Eagles and Cowboys meet again. Mm-hmm. Um, no reason for the Cowboys to rest their starters at that point. No. Elliott will be back, and the Eagles, if they have it wrapped up, there's really no reason to. Although to I don't know how much long, how much further down the depth chart the Cowboys can go at this point. I mean, tonight they had you know a lot of backups in there, but sure. I, I think uh, yeah, I agree. I think we're looking at 14, 13 win team. Yeah. I think they're they're going to win the they're going to win the the uh, they're going to finish with the top record in the NFC. I, I'm more convinced than ever after tonight that they're going to be the one seed. Yeah. All right, so we're going to wrap this up here. Um, just to finish it though, we would really appreciate it if you guys gave us five star reviews. You're listening at this point. You've made it 22, 23 minutes in. You hopefully like what you hear. Please go leave us those five star reviews. And if you're listening to us for the first time, we appreciate it. Go subscribe. We're on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, SoundCloud, Spreaker, on all your favorite podcast platforms. Um, we bring you the show twice a week, three actually three times a week. My bad. So we really appreciate it if you subscribed. And then for Tuesday, it's gonna be me, you, and Joe again. Yep. The reaction pod, the hot take pod. There's going to be a lot to talk about coming off of this. So tweet us your opinions. Use hashtag the no huddle show. Or if you want to email us, you can email us at the no huddle show at nj.com. Got a new shorter email address for you. you. And Make we sure will... you follow Elliot on Twitter at Elliot right. Short Park. Yep. I'm at Matt Lombardo PHL. Yep, we appreciate it. And we will be back on Tuesday to talk with Joe about this win a little more. Matt, I'll talk to you Tuesday. See you Tuesday.